banks have many exchange platforms already. Credit Suisse has a couple of great dark pools um, that that would that could easily accommodate. Sorry, yeah, we banks um, are familiar with building exchange uh, exchanges, um, regulated exchange products, and and trading creating exchange to accommodate cryptocurrencies is no is not really that difficult. It's not challenging. It's just a different ticker. Um, I think the challenge for for banks is really the 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 uncertainty around the legal framework, um, the regulatory framework, and that's why you know I think many many banks will will give pause uh, before jumping in. I think the the CME CBOE um, allows some institutional. You know, the other the other question you asked is about liquidity, and um, liquidity is 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 a it, institutional investors getting in, getting involved in size is is really about what. Finding liquidity, and uh, I think uh, to Jeff's point, all exchange, not all exchanges are the same. So, uh, and you'll find massive discrepancies or differences across different uh, exchanges, um, and that's where some of the arbitrage is. Right, you uh, one of the greatest trades that ran for about three years was um, BTC to USD back to what um, Rubindi and then back again. You just keep looping that every seven days. You can make ten thousand, uh, ten thousand percent returns, and that's what people were doing for about three years. Um, so it's it liquidity is. In fact, when, when was it? When Zimbabwe had their issue, um, for like three weeks, we found Zim dollar to BTC, uh, whilst the rest of Bitcoin was trading at around about six and a half thousand, seven thousand. Um, Zim to BTC was trading an equivalent dollars thirteen thousand. Um, so people trade that that if you can, um, you trade the uh, the inefficiency of the different um, FT pools or different but exchanges. It is an access problem, though. Yeah. Right. I mean, you you see you have that ARB opportunity in South Korea, but at an institutional level, you don't have the access to turn around those trades as quickly and as well. Right. We have the opportunity, and we we part of the WSBA conversation is with institutions globally, um, and while there's deep institutional interest, the tool set and framework to allow them to engage. Um, still isn't there yet. I mean, at a retail level, one of the larger exchanges cracking was down for 27 hours the yeah. other day. Coinbase has 13 million accounts. And yet sometimes, given a high volatility, there are backlogged hours on executions. Tell a hedge fund they're not going to get an execution. Find out what happens. And so this institutional conversation around liquidity, price discovery, the tools to do it, um, it's coming, but it's not there yet. Yeah, I think the assumption that everyone's, uh, the, I think, again, Jeff mentioned that you, you think that um, you're getting, how do you know you're getting best price execution, which is which is a requirement in the US for, for exchanges that you're trading on, but it's not a requirement for, because they're on a different different legal structure. So you, you might not be getting best price execution. In fact, on some exchanges, you certainly aren't. Um, so, yeah. Well, it's interesting because, I mean, security is a big issue. I have so many friends who said to me, oh, I wish I'd gotten into Bitcoin whenever, you know, last year, two years ago. And I always say to them, well, I'll be thankful that you didn't because I'm sure with all the viruses that get spread so easily, it would be gone in a nanosecond. So, I mean, I'm sure you heard about the Showtime incident where there was this Trojan who was stealing keys off people's machines. And so um, I, I think that the security aspect is is... Um, cannot be underestimated. I mean, any of those who have participated in these token offerings, as I have, um, you're constantly getting hack attempts. I've gotten my SIM card on my phone taken. I mean, I have gotten hacked nonstop. And so I recognize that, you know, if I, something as simple as one of those little nano devices can be very helpful, but you really need to have a strategy um, to hold on to that money. And it's not, you know, it's not that easy. So, and you bring that to the custody conversation now, right? At an institutional level, yeah. Who offers custody that would be suitable for that marketplace? Mm -hmm. That's only starting. So, I if it if it's okay, I'd like to just touch on one thing relating to liquidity and sort of the tensions that are out there right now and some possible future things that may happen. So a lot of people focus on the guidance from last summer from the SEC where they said that the Dow token was a security. The Dow, for those who don't know, was a virtual venture fund, and it did a token sale. Um, what they also said, though, was that not only was the Dow token a security, but the platform, the actual token sale platform that was used to trade the Dow token was a securities exchange and needed to register as a national securities exchange or avail itself of 
of an exemption from registration, such as by becoming an alternative trading system, or ATS. So what does that mean? Well, for all the exchanges around the world, right, they have a few choices. If they are serving U.S. persons, then they have a critical task if they don't want to register as an ATS or as a national securities exchange, in that they need to make sure that no tokens that are securities end up on their platform. That's why for a lot of the plat a lot of the cryptocurrency exchanges that US persons can access, there's a very small amount that you can choose from in terms of tokens. Or they could, for example, exclude non-US persons. So this leads to an interesting tension because if you're a token seller, you're going to want assuming that you may want to have a secondary market and have liquidity for your token right now. There aren't a whole lot of ATSs out there. There isn't a lot a way to have a token that is a security at the moment have a lot of liquidity. So people are straining or they have been straining to say, I have a token that is not a security and going through all these machinations and some, yes, some likely are not securities. Um, however, the window and the, the, the needles, <laughs> the hole in the needle is getting slimmer in terms of, of how you thread it and how you can say this is not a security. I, my personal view is that in the next year, we will see a growing number of self-identified security tokens. We already have seen the announcement with Codacoin recently, for example, which is being sold under Reg S and Reg D, so uh, accredited investors in the US and then certain persons from the US, the UK, Canada, and I think they said certain other jurisdictions. I think we'll also see some under Reg A plus and potentially some that are full-blown secu registered securities. We'll also see some utility tokens, I'm sure. But I think we will see a large number of ATSs springing up to provide liquidity. And in fact, um, I guess at the end of towards the end of last year, Rengen, T0, and the Argon Group had an announced a joint venture to have a an ATS. So I think that's what I think about liquidity. So, so going back to your situation where you know, you have to jump through all these all these hoops to, well, you can put dollar into crypto here, but then you need to go somewhere else where you can only do one crypto into another token. You know, these kinds of frictions and operational complexities, you know, it's part of the growing pains of the fact that we're still at the early stages of, of this market. Mm -hmm. And probably the frame of reference for, for most people in this room, and, and then, you know, for me as I started to get into the space, because I'm used to how other markets work and a lot of the operational convenience and safety and resilience. You know, if I sell something, the funds are available, you know, immediately, not eight days later. I don't have that uncertain. You know, there have been times, as, as Emmanuel and Ron were alluding to, where, you know, you, you know, I logged on to Coinbase to try to sell some Bitcoin. You know, I couldn't get in for a day and a half. Then I was like, okay, well, maybe I'm fated not to sell it. Let me see how it does. <laughs> no, the, 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 a behavioral psychologist or is, is you know just studying you know the fear of missing out people who you know there are you know I've friends who got in you know early and, and have a bunch of it and I'm like well is, isn't this great aren't you going to take something off the table and they say, say things like well I'm not going to sell anything until selling it would change my life I'm like, well, how much have you made already? And, you know, there's already six zeros after it, but they want seven or eight zeros after it before. So, th so this is the psychology of, you know, people who are, and, you know, I mean, I'm slightly skeptical, but I, I'm generally, you know, positive and, and bullish about the space, not investment advice. But, you know, I, I still think we, we are at the early phase of, you know, a new type of, you know, digitalization of assets where, um, it, you know, it's exciting and powerful, but also scary. You know, the, the fact that, you know, I can transmit an asset without going through an intermediary to you or you can send it to me, you know, that's very powerful. And that has not previously existed in the history of, of you know, of people. It's a very powerful thing, but it's also very vulnerable. The fact that we can send it to one another very easily makes it very easier easy to hack and steal, and, and that's why you need to have these devices and backup things, and then people have to figure out where they're going to write down all these words, because, <laughs> you know, it's putting these things, you know, it's giving individuals power, but, you know, that power is kind of very difficult, and it's, it's full of risks, and, you know, people offer convenience, 
But you know, will people continue to do that? I think we're at the early stage, and I think these these questions are going to be answered. You know, if you look if you look at 2018, we will have greater legal certainty over a lot of these things at the end of the year than we have right now. I think some of these operational challenges we will have made progress on, but I think there will still be plenty of unanswered questions. You know, we could be together here a year from now, and there will be progress. But I think it's still a work in progress.